In this lesson, we're going to cover everything you need to know about solutions for a typical general chemistry course. We'll start off with a description of the solution process, we'll talk about uh, trends in solubility, we'll talk about the various ways we measure concentration, and we'll finish this off with a discussion of colligative properties. That'll include the Van Hoff factor, freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, vapor pressure depression, i.e. Rowlett's law, as well as osmotic pressure. And if you feel like you learned something from this lesson, uh, like it, share it, subscribe if you want to be notified of future lessons, you know the drill. And if you're looking for good practice problems and study guides, check out chadsprep.com. My premium, my premium general chemistry course currently has over 1,200 practice questions. All right, so let's start this off with a discussion of the solution process. And my little red squares here are gonna represent a solute, and my blue circles here are gonna represent the solvent, and a solution is composed of both the solute and the solvent. The solvent is typically a liquid, the solute can be a solid, liquid, or gas. A little bit of review from chapter four. So for the solution process, if you want a solute to mix in with a solvent, three things need to happen for this to, to occur. And the first is we need to take all of these lovely solvent molecules and spread them out. One more, nine. So we gotta spread them out to make room for the solute particles to fit in. And so there's intermolecular forces holding all these molecules closer together. And so to spread them out is gonna cost energy. So delta H for this process is definitely going to be positive, greater than zero, so endothermic. So however, we're gonna have to do the exact same thing with the solute particles. We're gonna have to spread them out and any intermolecular forces holding them together have to overcome as well. And that is also going to have a positive delta H and be endothermic as well. However, then they're finally going to mix. So, and again, we'll be spreading this out a little bit. So, but now they're gonna mix. And once they mix, we are gonna form some new interactions here. So, and these are gonna be some new intermolecular forces and you know, what they are depends on the nature of the solute and the solvent and stuff, but we're gonna form some of these new ones, and this is the only part of the solution process that's actually gonna be exothermic and release energy. So, and depending on the nature of the solute and solvents, it might be more or less exothermic, uh, again, just depending on their nature. So we'll kind of see some examples here. So governing principle in solubility is that like dissolves like. So if the solute and solvent are alike in terms of polarity, then it's probably gonna you know, the, the solute's probably gonna dissolve in the solvent. So in this case, the reason for that is that, you know, let's say that, uh, let's say this is water here, which has hydrogen bonding as its strongest intermolecular force. And let's say that this is methanol, which also has hydrogen bonding for its strongest intermolecular force. And so it's rather strong forces. We've got to break apart to separate these. So it's pretty endothermic at the beginning, but the forces we're going to form between them at the end, it's also going to be hydrogen bonding. And so the forces we create, so when they mix, are going to be roughly on par with the forces we had to break to separate them apart. And so energetically, delta H for the entire process is probably not too far away from zero. So what ends up governing the process ends up being what we call the delta S of mixing. So, and in this case, if I say you haven't really learned too much about what entropy is that's coming down the road in the future, but if I say it's, it's related to disorder, so, and when you've got a mixture here, you've got more disorder than when you had pure solute and pure solvent. And this is usually what's fueling things mixing. Now, if we contrast this for a second, let's say instead of methanol up here, let's say we make this oil. And so these are now oil particles instead. And so again, separating out the water molecules is gonna cost energy. Separating out the oil molecules is gonna cost some energy as well. So however, when they mix together to the degree that they do, and we know that oil and water largely don't mix, doesn't mean they don't mix at all, but it means they mix very little, it turns out. So but in the places where they did mix, it turns out these interactions we're gonna form between something very polar and something non-polar are not going to be very favorable, it turns out. So. In fact, you'll find out that, you know, water's gonna end up forming highly ordered structures around the oil molecules that do make it in and stuff, and it's a mess. But needless to say, it's a big energy expenditure to break these apart, especially for the hydrogen bonding and water, but we don't form very strong interactions to replace them. And so delta H for the entire process now would be positive, which is not favorable for a spontaneous process, and it's not gonna be spontaneous. And that's why oil and water don't mix. Cool, now we've got just a little bit of vocab to talk about. 
Um, we've got missable and immissable. Let's get those words up on the board here. So missable and immissible. So and if you're mix mixing two liquids now, so if your solute's a liquid along with your solvent, so if they mix in any ratio, we refer to them as being missable. And if they really don't mix and form two different layers like oil and water, then we'd refer to them as being immiscible with each other. Uh, then we've got saturated, unsaturated, and super saturated. So we'll start with unsaturated and saturated, and it turns out, regardless of you know what your solvent and solute are, so outside of you know some miscible and miscible, but for other solutes, typically you can only add so much into a solvent before you add any more than that and it doesn't dissolve. And so once you've added the maximum you possibly could, we refer to that as being saturated. Now we can add salt into water and you can add quite a bit of salt into water, but you will eventually reach a point where you keep adding salt into water and all of a sudden you just get salt crystals that sink down to the bottom of your beaker or your pot or whatever you're using. So, and at that point, when as much salt could be dissolved as is normally dissolved, we call it saturated. And up until that point, when we had less than that amount, we'd just refer to that as an unsaturated solution. Cool, then we can also talk about a super saturated solution. This is uh, uh, kind of an anomaly here, so it's not a normal situation, but you can actually get more of a solute dissolved in some cases than the maximum, which seems kind of strange. So if you've ever made rock candy, and that's becoming less popular, uh, so, but if you grew up in my generation, you probably made rock candy somewhere along the way uh, in school or preschool or something like that. And so to make rock candy, what they do is they heat up water. So usually to boiling, and then they add a bunch of sugar. And the reason you do it at very high temperatures is you can dissolve a lot more sugar at high temperatures. It's a lot more soluble, it turns out. And we'll, we'll see that in a trend in solubility here in a little bit. So, and if you, as long as you cool the water really slowly, so as it cools down, the solubility is going to go down. And at some point you'll actually drop below so you'll, your temperature drop you know, far enough that you'll drop below kind of the solubility of the amount of, of sugar that's actually in your water when you're making this rock candy. And so typically, if you just try to dissolve sh that much sugar into that water at that lower temperature now, you wouldn't be able to do it. But in this creative way where you've heated it up and very slowly cooled it down, you've ended up with an unstable situation where you've got more sugar dissolved in the water than would normally be able to stay in the water. And it turns out it's not a stable situation. So, and if you drop a crystal of sugar in there, or if you put something with jagged edges, like a piece of string or a stick or, you know, things of this sort, you're giving, so you're giving a seed, if you will, for the crystals to grow on. And all of a sudden you just get crystals everywhere and crystals come out of that solution until we go back to having just a plain old saturated solution. So super saturated is when you have more, again, solute than the normal maximum dissolved. But again, it's an unstable and an abnormal situation. Next, we want to take a look at the solubility of first gases in different solvents and then solids in different solvents. And we'll start with the gases here. And turns out the solubility of a gas in a liquid, it seems a little bit counterintuitive, but again, what do fish breathe? Fish breathe oxygen and they breathe oxygen that's actually dissolved in water. And so gases totally can be dissolved in a liquid. So, and it turns out their solubility depends on a couple of things and that's both temperature and pressure. And so gases are gonna be more soluble at high pressure. So if we start with that one, to kind of look at a gas here, we've got this gas above say water and some of that gas actually dissolves in the liquid. And it turns out you establish an equilibrium here. So between the two. And so the more of this gas you put up here, it shifts this equilibrium to get a little more down here as well. And so that's why you get a greater solubility if you have a greater pressure of the gas above it. So, and it turns out gases are more soluble at low temperatures. And we can kind of see that on this graph here, that as temperature goes up, the solubility of O2, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen all decrease at higher temperatures. And kind of think of it this way. So if you look at kind of uh, these gaseous atoms or molecules in the gaseous state versus when they're aqueous here, so they're gonna have more kinetic energy at higher temperatures. I'm sorry they're gonna have more kinetic energy when they're in the gas phase than when they're gonna be in the aqueous phase. And as you increase the temperature, you start giving the molecules in general more kinetic energy. And so some of these ones that are dissolved down here are gonna break free of the intermolecular forces holding them in there and end up preferring to be in the gaseous phase instead. And so at high temperatures, you get more in the gaseous phase, less actually though dissolved in your solvent. Um, if you kind of look at uh, boiling some water to make spaghetti or something like that. So if I give you a big stock pot full of water, so, and you started boiling it. So 
you wouldn't expect a big stock pot full of water to boil on your stove in like 30 seconds or a minute. It's probably going to take five to 10 minutes to get that boiling and stuff like that, even with your stove on high. What you will notice though, is that long before it ever actually boils, you'll see little bubbles coming off the bottom of your pan. And that's not like water boiling right there. That's actually these gases that as the temperature inside the, the pot goes up, their solubilities go down and they're coming out of solution there. Cool. So definitely know that gases are more soluble at high pressures, but low temperatures. So there's also something that we can quantify it with. And we call it Henry's law. And so the solubility of a gas in a liquid, so is equal to some form of Henry's law constant times the partial pressure of that gas uh, above that solution. So it turns out these Henry's law constants are specific for a solute solvent pair. And they're also temperature dependent as we see that solubility is totally temperature dependent as well. So, but for example, if you looked at the Henry's law constant for oxygen gas, O2 gas at 25 degrees Celsius room temp, you'd find it is 1.3 times 10 to the negative three. And the units on this are molarity per atmosphere. So what this essentially means is that for every one atmosphere of gas of that, you know, in this case, oxygen that you have above the liquid, you'll get this molarity to dissolve. And so if you had two, atmosp two atmospheres pressure of O2 above the solution, you'd get double this number of molarity there, so on and so forth. And that's what this equation ultimately means. Now, sometimes they don't actually express it as molarity per atmosphere. They break molarity up and you get moles per liter per atmospheres, but you should realize that is exactly the same thing. So if I said, hey, what is the uh, uh, solubility of oxygen gas in water at room temperature? So at, you know, sea level. So you'd say, okay, solubility of the gas equals that Henry's law constant, 1.3 times 10 to the negative three molarity per atmosphere. So when at sea level, we've got a total pressure of one atmosphere, but the partial pressure of oxygen there is just 0.21 atmospheres, approximately. So we can multiply that through, and fortunately I've already done this on my calculator, and this was give us a molarity in the water of 2.73 times 10 to the negative four molar. This would be the solubility of O2 gas in water at 25 degrees Celsius. Cool, and at sea level. All right, so that's the solubility of gases. Let's take a look at the solubility of solids. All right, so we want to take a look at the solubility of three ionic solids here. So lead nitrate, potassium bromide, and potassium dichromate. And you can see that in general, though, all of their solubilities increase at higher temperatures. Some look more linear than others. Some look a little more logarithmic. So, but they all increase at higher temperatures. Now, uh, I didn't pick, you know, cherry pick these or anything like that, but for the vast majority of ionic solids, their solubilities increase at higher temperatures. There are a couple of exceptions out there, but as a general rule, we expect most ionic solids to have their solubilities increase at higher temperatures. Cool. Um, we're not going to quantify this in any way, which is qualitatively. We want to take this concept home. All right, we want to take a quick look at the various ways we measure concentration in chemistry. And molarity, you've pretty much already learned. So, and it's the most common way we measure it in chemistry, but in this chapter on solutions, so some of the others are gonna be very important. So, but reminder, molarity is moles of solute. So, and I'm using here to uh, represent moles over liters of solution. So the entire volume of the solution in liters. So what's new probably to you in this chapter is molality. And so molality, not capital M like molarity is a lowercase m for the symbol. So, and in this case, it's moles of solute instead of over liters of solution, it's just over the number of kilograms of solvent. Now it turns out for dilute aqueous solutions, so dilute solutions in water, where you don't have a lot of solute, molarity and molality often are pretty close to exactly the same number. And the reason they are is that one kilogram of water, so happens to be one liter of water as well. And so as long as there's not a lot of solute, so pretty much the liters of water would be pretty close to the liters of the entire solution. And so the liters of solution and the kilograms of solvent would be pretty darn close to the same thing. Now, as you get more and more solute though, these two numbers are going to deviate because as you add more and more solute, your solution's gonna get bigger, but your kilograms of solvent isn't gonna change at all. And so as you add more and more solute, so because of uh, the denominator up here getting bigger and bigger and bigger, your molarity is going to end up lower than your molality for more concentrated solutions. 
Cool. This molality is important though. We're going to use this in some of our colligative properties that we'll study in a little bit. Um, and so that's why it's being introduced right now. So mole fraction uh, is very similar. And you could talk about the mole fraction of the solvent, which would just be the moles of solvent over the moles of solute and solvent combined, i.e. the total moles. Or you could look at the mole fraction for the solute, and it would be moles of solute over again, moles of solute and solvent combined, the total. So, and you could look at either one of these and we'll see that uh, we're going to find the mole fraction of the solvent when it comes to Rolloult's law with vapor pressure depression, one of our colligative properties, and hence the relevance here. But this isn't the first time you've seen mole fractions. You saw them with Dalton's law of partial pressures as well in dealing with gases. Now we're bringing it up with solutions here. All right, finally, we've got mass percents, and you guys are probably pretty well familiar with how you find a percentage. You take the part over the total times 100, and that's a percent. So in this case, if I want the mass percent of solute, I just take the mass of the solute divided by the total mass of the solution, solute and solvents combined, so in times 100. Cool, and that's a mass percent. So one thing you might not re recognize though is that a percent is always a per 100. And so to find a percent, you always end up multiplying by 100 at the end. Now, we're gonna talk about parts per million, sometimes and even more dilute solutions, we talk about parts per billion, and it is just like a percent, except instead of multiplying by 100 at the end, with parts per million, you multiply by a million at the end. If you were doing parts per billion, it would be multiplying by a billion at the end of the calculation here. But it's still just mass of solute, part, over mass of the whole solution total, times, instead of 100, times a million for parts per million here. Now. Often this works out instead of expressing it like this, which is what it is, and makes sense to me personally. So we'll often express it like this instead. And it's factor in this 10 to the sixth right from the get-go, and we'll take the milligrams of the solute over the kilograms of solution. And the idea is that milligrams and kilograms are different by a factor of 10 to the sixth, and it already accounts for this part of it, which is why it's not needed. And so if you already just know your kilograms of solution, milligrams of solute, rather than finding their masses in the same units and then multiply by 10 to the sixth, you can just go milligrams over kilograms and be done right from the get-go. Now, if you're dealing with aqueous solutions, if you recall, we also said that water, again, one liter of water weighs one kilogram. And as long as we're talking about fairly dilute aqueous solutions, oftentimes this gets reduced down to milligrams of solute over liters of solution as well. So you'll see this used quite ubiquitously, although for more concentrated solutions, maybe we shouldn't be using it. So, but it's almost exactly the same thing as what we had right here, again, for dilute aqueous solutions. So now we're gonna have a fairly comprehensive discussion of colligative properties. Now, a colligative property is a property of a solution that as you add solute, it changes more and more. The more solute you add, the more it changes. So, and these include things like freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, vapor pressure depression, which is governed by Rollitt's law, uh, and finally, osmotic pressure, which we'll deal with when we get there. So, for example, let's say you had some water. So normally, pure water has a freezing point of zero degrees Celsius and a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere. Now, let's say instead of pure water, now you start either pouring in some sugar or pouring in some salt, just pouring in some solute that's going to dissolve. And largely, the identity of the solute is not going to be important as long as it dissolves in the water. And what you'll find out is that after you pour some solute in, the freezing point's no longer going to be zero. It's going to be lower than than zero degrees Celsius. And the boiling point's no longer gonna be 100 degrees Celsius, it's gonna be higher than 100 degrees Celsius. And what's interesting is the identity of the solute is not that important. So any solute is gonna cause the lowering of that freezing point and the raising of that boiling point. So kind of interesting. Um, if we look, there is one characteristic about the solute that is important, it's what we call the Van Hoff factor. So, and it turns out the Van Hoff factor just gives us a description of how many pieces uh, a particular solute dissociates into, in this case, an electrolyte, how many ions it dissociates into. So if we start with something like, say, methanol, or maybe glucose. So these are molecular compounds, and they're molecular compounds that are not acidic or basic. And back in chapter four, you learned that they are non-electrolytes. And for a non-electrolyte, it doesn't dissociate into ions at all. And so for every molecule of either one of these you get, you get one you know, dissolved piece in your solution. And so as a result, for non-electrolytes, your Van Hoff factor is simply one. Every molecule provides one dissolved particle. That's it. Okay. So move on to some electrolytes here, and we'll go on to strong electrolytes that dissociate into ions completely. So something like NaCl. NaCl dissociates to give one single sodium ion and one single chloride ion, but two total ions, and therefore the Van Hoff factor is going to be 
two. Let's make this a little more complicated. Let's put something with polyatomic ions in there. So aluminum nitrate is another strong electrolyte, dissociates completely into ions. The cation is aluminum and you get one of those. So, but nitrate is the anion and you get three of those. But notice the polyatomic ions themselves don't split apart in atoms or anything. That's one of the mistakes students make is they try to start splitting apart the polyatomics. So, but it's just cations and anions separate, but don't break up any polyatomics further than that. But we got one cation, four anion, I'm sorry, one cation, three anions, a total of four ions. And so your Van Hoff factor is four. Cool. And so just by visual inspection, as long as you know something's a strong electrolyte, you can kind of predict how many ions it's going to split apart into and therefore predict its Van Hoff factor. And the idea is it's not just the total mol uh, molality, we'll find out, uh, of the solute, so, but it's going to be the total concentration of all dissolved species. And so if it splits apart into multiple pieces, we want to factor that in. All right, now we'll take a specific look at freezing point depression and boiling point elevation. So. Uh, freezing points do indeed go down, boiling points go up, and we want to talk a little bit about why, and then we'll get into the math of it here. So let's say you've got a crystalline substance here, and it freezes into a nice, pretty crystal structure here. Cool. So what happens is the molecules, let's say in the liquid phase, are moving around and stuff like that. And as you lower the temperature, they slow down. So, and at some point you've slowed it down enough that the intermolecular forces take over and lock it into place. So, but this is only gonna happen when they slow down enough. Well, once you stick an impurity in there of any sort, the impurity, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's not the same thing as the solvent. And so in this case, I'm just gonna put some random impurity in there and represent it uh, as being different with a different color and a different shape. So, and the problem is now I've put a kink in this crystal. There's something there that doesn't belong and it doesn't fit into the crystal structure quite as well. And as a result, we're gonna actually have to cool the solution down even lower than normal to where it will actually freeze into this imperfect crystal. And that's why freezing points get lowered. And you can look at it as freezing points get lowering, but it's also a lowering of the melting point of the, of the solid if you wanna look at it that way as well. So it works either way, the freezing point and the melting point are one and the same. So, but this is kind of the crux behind freezing point depression. Now, boiling point elevation is gonna be a little bit harder to explain. So with boiling point elevation, it's not, a, you know, a lot of students are, are taught incorrectly that, well, I guess the intermolecular forces are going up when you have the mixture, and that's not true. So what you actually go on, got going on is something a little bit different. So if we take a look here, so, and I'm gonna plot vapor pressure versus temperature. So, and it turns out uh, this is something you intuitively already know, but vapor pressure goes up as you go to higher temperatures. So, and you know this intuitively, you just don't realize that you know this. So, but if I gave you the option and I'm gonna put on a plate in front of you, so a turd fresh out of the freezer or one fresh out of the microwave, which would you prefer? So, and I'm reading your mind, you're saying the one out of the freezer because you like them crunchy, I know. No, you want the one out of the freezer because it's not gonna smell as bad. Because as temperature goes up, the vapor coming off that turd's gonna be worse, and so the one out of the microwave is gonna smell a lot worse. So, and think about it, it's giving off a lot more vapor. For you to smell it, whether it's cold or warm, you have to have poop molecules in your nose, and I'm glad I could ruin your life when you think about that. So, but that's the deal, you get more vapor at higher temperatures. And eventually, at some point, when you reach one atmosphere, that actually is when a substance boils. Cool, so you, you hit the temperature high enough till you actually hit one atmosphere. So for the vapor pressure, and that's when you actually reach the boiling temperature. And it turns out what's really happening there is once you hit that vapor pressure of one atmosphere, that's when what we call the chemical potential of the liquid and the chemical potential of the gas are equal. So, and it's once they are equal, that's when you actually get it to boil as well. Another way to look at it. So that's more of a physical chemistry way of looking at it. So, but what happens when you add solute is it changes your curve. So it actually changes your curve and it shifts it down a little bit. So it turns out when you dissolve a solute in there, it lowers the chemical potential of the liquid. So, 
So that solid, whatever solute it is, is going to dissolve and mix with the solvent, in this case water maybe, spontaneously, and that lowers its energy. Spontaneous things always lower the energy. And by lowering the energy of the liquid, we have to heat it up even hotter than normal till it actually is, has a chemical potential equal with the gas, or an, if we look at it, until we actually reach one atmosphere vapor pressure and get this new boiling temperature. So uh, this is not the most satisfying answer in the world of what's going on. It's a little heady. It's just sometimes easier to lie to students and say, oh, the intermolecular forces get bigger when you make the mixture, which is totally wrong. So this is really the real reason. So, but takeaway here was a good convenient time for me to teach that, you know, boiling point is really when the vapor pressure reaches the external pressure. So that's kind of a convenient time to teach it and stuff like that. So, but that's the real reason behind boiling point elevation. So let's take a look at a little bit of the math though involved with both of these. All right, so here's the typical equations you're given. So uh, your change in your freezing point or your change in your boiling point depends on the molality of your solute. If it breaks up into pieces, it'll depend on how many pieces it breaks up into, it's Van Hoff factor, and then a characteristic constant. So either a freezing point constant or a boiling point constant. Now boiling points go up and so the change is always gonna be positive, but freezing points go down so the change is always gonna be negative. Now, most of the time when they present it, it just looks like this and they expect you to remember that it's negative. Personally, I just like putting the negative sign right into the equation. That way when you calculate the change in the freezing point, it always goes down. All right, so let's say I wanted you to calculate the new freezing point, the new boiling point of say two molal. If I can write the number two to make it look good, two molal NaCl. So if we've got two molal NaCl, you have to look at that and say, oh yeah, he's a strong electrolyte. So you get one sodium, one chloride, and your Van Hoff factor is two. Okay, and from there on, it's just plug and chug. And so we'll get change in our freezing point equals negative two for the Van Hoff factor. Freezing point constant here is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. Notice what that really means is that for every molal of total dissolved species, you get a drop in your freezing point of 1.86 degrees Celsius. Cool. And then finally, we'll multiply by our two molal concentration of NaCl. All right. So if you notice by taking I times M, what you're really getting is the total concentration of dissolved species. It's two molal NaCl, but because you have one sodium, one chloride, you actually have a four molal concentration of total dissolved species. And we're gonna multiply that by the 1.86. And if we do so here, we're gonna get negative 7.44 degrees Celsius. That is the change in our freezing point. And if the question just said, calculate the change in the freezing point, we're done. Now, if the question said, don't calculate the change in the freezing point, but what is ultimately the freezing point? Well, your freezing point here is gonna be your original freezing point plus that change in the freezing point. Well, it's convenient for water that the freezing point's just zero. And so when I add that change in of negative 7.44 to zero, I'm still just gonna get negative 7.44 degrees Celsius. And so because water just conveniently has a freezing point of, of zero, so whether I say the change in the freezing point or the freezing point, it comes out the same. But the reason I took pains to kind of go through the whole process here is so that you can see that if you know we didn't have water, if I wanted the actual freezing point, you'd have to start with the original and then add the change to it. Now, if we do the same thing with the boiling point here, calculation works exactly the same. So two, got a boiling point constant here for water. So 0 0.51 degrees Celsius per molal. And again, our two molal NaCl. And work this out, two times two is four and four times a half would be two plus a little change here. So that would be like 2.04 degrees Celsius, and that's our change in our boiling point. Now our boiling point though, takes the original boiling point and adds into it that change. And the original boiling point of water is not zero. In this case, it's 100 degrees Celsius. And so we're gonna get 102.04 degrees Celsius for our new boiling point. So you can see here that as we add solute, the boiling point goes up, the freezing point goes down and the range over which water exists as a liquid is expanded a little bit at both ends. All right, so you might have to do a little bit of calculations here, you know, and some plugging and chugging. You might also get a question that you can avoid doing, you know, any significant amount of math on. So they might just ask you, hey, you know, which of the following has the highest boiling point, for instance? And let's say I give you one molal CH3OH and I give you 0 0.6 molal NaCl, and I give you 0 0.5 molal AlNO33. 
And I give you those three solutions as you say, which has the highest boiling point or which has the lowest freezing point or something along those lines. And I could also say lowest boiling point and highest freezing point, same diff, but I'm gonna start with highest boiling point, lowest freezing point. So in this case, what you really wanna do is not just take into account the molality, but again, you want the total dissolved species concentration, which multiplies the Van Hoff factor times the molality. And that's what ultimately is gonna, you know, clue you in on this answer. So in this case, for the first one here, it's a non-electrolyte, I is one. And so I times M just equals one. So for the second one here, so NaCl, we said the Van Hoff factor is two times 0.6 and you're gonna have 1.2 molal total concentration of dissolved species. So, and finally for aluminum nitrate, we looked at him earlier as well, his Van Hoff factor was four, and four times 0.5 is gonna be 2.0 molal concentration of total dissolved species. And because he's got the highest concentration of total dissolved species, he'll have the highest boiling point, but the lowest freezing point. And so if the question was who's got the highest boiling point, aluminum nitrate wins. If it's who's got the lowest freezing point, aluminum nitrate wins. However, if I said who's got the lowest boiling point, well, then the one that, you know, goes up the least wins. He wins. But notice the tricky one, though, is it seems backwards, but if I say who's got the highest freezing point, well, the highest freezing point is the one that has gone down the least. And that, again, is the methanol here, the CH3OH. And that's the one that, you know, students think is just the trickiest here. So, but if we look at the normal freezing point for water at zero, so the methanol goes down a little. So the NaCl is gonna go down a little more and the aluminum nitrate is gonna go down a little more yet. But the one that went down the least was the methanol. And that's why overall, kind of on an absolute scale, he's got the highest freezing point of any of those three solutions because he went down the least. All right, the next colligative property to look at is what's called vapor pressure depression. And it's governed by Rawlitz law, which we see right here. So and to pick apart Rawlitz law real quick, so this is the partial pressure. So the vapor pressure of your solvent above a solution. This is the mole fraction of that solvent. And this is the partial pressure of what your, uh, or the vapor pressure uh, would be above your pure solvent in this case. So for example, I've got pure water here and the pressure of water vapor above pure water at 298 Kelvin, I'm gonna say I'm gonna round up, it turns out, but uh, it's gonna be right around 24 Tor. So, and that's what goes right here. So if you've got a solution, so in this case, uh, that the solution, the solvent is water, then you wanna know what's the vapor pressure above pure water at a certain temperature. And we're gonna deal with the same temperature. So we said that vapor pressure totally dependent on temperature. So we have to compare, you know, pure water and a solution of water at the same temperature. So cool. So the asterisk here de designates for the pure liquid. So it's 24 Tor. Now in the second solution here, we've only got a solution that's got nine moles of water and one mole in this case of glucose. And I'm going to treat glucose as what we call a non-volatile uh, solute in this case. It's not going to have any vapor up here at all. That's what non-volatile I mean. Now, whether it was volatile or non-volatile is not going to affect our calculation, but if it was volatile, in addition to water vapor up here, you might have some of the solute vapor up here. Like say I made it methanol or something, that might be the case. But the calculation for the vapor pressure of the solvent would be no different than what we're doing here. All right. So in this case, nine out of 10 moles are still water. It's 90% water. And because it's 90% water versus 100% water, it's only gonna have 90% of the vape pressure that pure water had. So if pure water has a vape pressure of 24 Tor, so our water solution here, that's only 90% water, it's only gonna have 90% of 24 Tor. And so if you subtract off 10%, 10% would be 2.4. So 24 minus 2.4, is gonna be 21.6 Tor. Cool, and notice we kinda of did that in our heads, but I mean, we'll plug it into the, the equation here as well. So again, this, this Greek letter chi right here stands for mole fraction. In this case, it's the mole fraction of the solvent, not the solute. And so in this case, it is nine out of 10. Cool, and from there, we just calculate the partial pressure of, in our case, the water. So a nine tenths of 24 Tor, exactly as we already figured it out, 21.6 Tor. Cool. And that's really all there is to Rawlitz Law. Now it turns out Rawlitz Law is most accurate for really dilute solutions. So as you get more and more solute, it gets to be less and less accurate uh, of reality and stuff like that. So, but for really dilute solutions, it's a pretty decent equation.
All right, the last colligative property we're going to talk about is osmotic pressure. And you might uh, uh, be f somewhat familiar with the term osmosis, and osmosis is the diffusion of water. Now, diffusion was when something from, went from areas of high concentration and spread out to areas of low concentration. So, and that's what's going to happen with water here with osmosis, where water is more pure and in a higher concentration of water, it's going to spread out and move towards areas where there's a lower concentration of water. So if we look here, we've got like my little mock set up here, and there is right down the middle of this thing, a semi-permeable membrane. On the left side of that membrane, there's pure water. On the right hand side, there's a one molar aqueous solution of sodium chloride. So, and water here is more pure and in a higher concentration on the left than on the right. And so that water is gonna want to travel from left to right. Now, I put this membrane between the two that's semi-permeable, and we can select, you know, the membrane to have properties to keep, you know, allow to pass what we want to and what, you know, to keep in what we don't. So this semi-permeable membrane is going to allow water to pass across, but no solutes. And so in this case, the water wants to travel to the right from where water is in a high concentration to where water is in a lower concentration. So the sodium chloride wants to travel left, but the membrane says, nope, can't do it. So we only have to consider the diffusion of water, not the diffusion of solutes based on our semi-permeable membrane here. So just osmosis. As a result, you can kind of look and see on this side, then what's gonna to wanna to happen to the level of the water right there? Well, as water travels across, it's gonna to wanna to rise. And what's gonna to happen to the water level on this side? It's gonna to wanna to drop. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply a downward pressure on this side. And the amount of pressure we would have to push down and apply to this piston on this side to keep the water level from rising exactly is actually what's termed the osmotic pressure. So this propensity of water to want to travel this way causes a pressure over on this side, and we can counteract it right there to figure out exactly how big it is. Now, it turns out the equation for it is right here. So pi equals the Van Hoff factor, still factors in. So times molarity times R times T. So in this case, with osmotic pressure, it's not molality, it's molarity. So, and also here, the Greek letter pi is what we use for osmotic pressure. Now, if you recall with our ideal gas law back in the day, we had P V equals N R T, where the P here stood for gas pressure, not osmotic pressure. So, but it turns out you can kind of almost derive an expression looking like this. So just by dividing through by V and N over V is moles over liters, which is molarity. And you get pressure equals molarity times RT. Now again, this is gas pressure, so it's not the same thing as osmotic pressure, but we can derive an eerily similar looking equation. Now we do have to still factor in that Van Hoff factor. So, but I just wanted to show you that we can kind of derive something looking similar to this from our ideal gas law. All right, so going back to osmotic pressure. So, one, you're going to get things like this, and you might have to predict, uh, you know, which way is the water going to travel and stuff like that. Or you might have to look and predict, you know, where you're going to have a greater osmotic pressure and things of that sort. So uh, if you look at the way this works in, in our calculation here, so pi equals IMRT. So in our case, the NaCl is our solute. It is a Van Hoff factor still of two. The molarity of it was one molar. So R here, so we want to come out with units of pressure. And so I want to come out in atmospheres in this case. So I'm going to use our classic value of R of 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Cool. And then I want to calculate the osmotic pressure specifically at 298 Kelvin. So that has to be given as well. Cool. And from there, it is plug and chug. So, and if we work this out, and conveniently I already worked it out, so with my handy dandy calculator, it's 48.9 atmospheres. That would be the osmotic pressure. So being exerted as the water tries to travel from the left-hand side to the right-hand compartment. So if you pushed down here with a, a pressure of exactly 48.9 atmospheres, you would keep the water level from rising. Now, what would happen if you only pressed with a pressure of 40 atmospheres? Well, then the water level is going to rise. So what if, on the other hand, you pressed with a pressure of 100 atmospheres? Well, again, the osmotic pressure is only exerting an upward pressure of 48.9 atmospheres. If you press down and apply a pressure of 100 atmospheres, you win, essentially, and you're going to actually cause the water level to decrease. You're going to push that piston down, and that's going to force water 
to the other side of the semipermeable membrane and you're going to make more purified water. So you're actually causing osmosis to go in reverse and make purified water. That sounds familiar. You're doing reverse osmosis. That's how a reverse osmosis system works. So big problem though here is that initially you're pushing down with 100 atmospheres, but notice what happens here. As you force water across to the other side, the concentration of salt over here is actually going to increase as you get rid of more and more solvent, more and more water to the other side. And as that increases, then your osmotic pressure goes up. And eventually you'll have forced out enough water that the osmotic pressure would now be 100 atmospheres and equal the force, or I'm sorry, equal the pressure that you're pushing down with. So, and at that point, if you can't apply any greater pressure than that, well, then you're done. So, and that's how, kind of how your reverse osmosis system works. It presses for as long as it can to make as much purified water as it can. So, until the osmotic pressure pushing back is equal to the pressure pushing forward. And then it just says, okay, we're done. And you've got some concentrated salt over here, and it dumps it down your drain, and you start all over again with some new tap water. You do the whole process all over again, making some more purified water. Cool. That is osmotic pressure. You should understand what it is. You should understand how to do the calculation. You should be able to understand, you know, osmosis and which way water is going to travel, things of that sort. Cool. If you learned anything from this lesson, like, share, subscribe, you know the drill. And if you're looking for good practice problems and study guides, check out chadsprep.com.